सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली we been so preoccupied with our own issues particularly with our domestic politics also some troubles in our country manipur for example that it's a good question to ask if we even remember that there is a war going on in the world it's a big war involving one big power a kind of one that used to be the deputy superpower until the rise of china but yet is a superpower militarily that's russia and a smaller nation which is not such a military power but is backed by the largest the biggest superpower in the world that's america and nato that's ukraine so there is a war going on we haven't even done an update of, of the war on the war for almost 2 months now so this is time it's particularly a good time now because ukraine's counter if offensive such as it is and there is a, and there is a reason why i say such as it is counter offensive has now completed its two weeks it began around the first of this month ukraine is now maintaining a lot of operational security or opsec as it's called and is now attacking or counter attacking along multiple axes the reason we say counter offensive such as it is because this counter offensive has not turned out to be what we might have imagined maybe with our own experience of reading military history our own understanding of seeing military operations because all of that comes from the past either it either it comes from the past the world wars in case of india our big battles with the pakistanis the big tank battles etc in the plains or or in terms of what we saw in the gulf war which were one sided so you had see the american led tanks going in from one side massacring uh iraqi tanks and then and then it was all over no this is now modern warfare and this modern warfare is very different in this one attack attack and defense both have acquired a different meaning and that is where the clutter lies for this episode of ctc now for example let me give you high points or interesting points from this counter offensive as it's going on Number one, we've seen no armored columns going ahead in this counteroffensive. Armored columns would mean fifty, sixty, hundred tanks, armored personnel carriers, or infantry fighting vehicles, or infantry fighting vehicles, or the modern combat avatar of the earlier armored personnel carriers. These are infantry fighting vehicles or IFVs. IFVs in place of APCs. So you don't see their massed columns. That is fifty, hundred. sort of going down the plains of europe these are the flat plains of europe with no with no barriers no canals or ditch cum bunds that say india and pakistan build uh, dig to 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 protect themselves against the other armor assault so no ditch cum bund kind of a uh, kind of constructions here no canals no forests no tree no tree cover no mountains nothing everything is everything is out in the open so the movies that you've seen in the past or the books that we have read in the past particularly from the days of cold war these had visions of thousands of soviet tanks driving down rampaging through these flat plains of europe and then then being met by resistance from the other side by nato forces and air power etc etc no such thing is happening you haven't seen an armored column from the ukrainian side which is bigger than say 20 30 vehicles of all kinds usually a couple of these will be tanks or maybe three tanks maybe 10 or 12 ifvs infantry fighting vehicles now we've seen more and more of the american given bradley infantry fighting vehicles these are supposedly very modern and very effective so you see a few of them just a handful of tanks we've seen some german leopard tanks very modern and maybe one odd truck mounted or an armored truck mounted air defense system which is short range missile system and couple of communication vehicles right that's all so a convoy of 15 20 again you don't see them spread out over the country you see them actually going on the roads they're going on the roads in a single file that means these look more like probing operations that is i am carrying infantry in my ifvs 
as and when there's an opportunity, the infantry comes down and fights. So Ukrainians are not making the mistake that the Russians had made in the first round, which is send out their armor without infantry support. That is something that anybody who's even read about the wars that Napoleon fought and the reason and the reasons why he lost at Waterloo. He lost at Waterloo. One of the reasons was that he did not have he did not have infantry backing his cavalry, which in this in, in this case, in that case used to be horse cavalry. So tanks, the, the armored vehicles are today's horse cavalry. They have to be protected by infantry. So that is the mistake. That is the mis mistake Napoleon made at Waterloo. That's the mistake the Russians made early on in this war when they sent those humongous columns of armored vehicles onto Cape until they reached the outskirts of Cape and then the Ukrainians trapped them in a killing zone. And when the Ukrainians started doing that, firing missiles from both sides from as close as 500 to 400 meters, the Russians did not have the infantry to go out and confront them. Ukrainians are not making that error. In fact, if you see these columns, 15, 20 vehicles, one gets hit. Usually, because these are well-protected vehicles, you find inventory infantry in the vehicles jumping out. Those videos are all available. Some pictures where those are available will show you because drones are all over the battlefield. That's the next point. All of these battles are now being fully videographed, especially in daytime. So they get down, they stop the column there, they recover their vehicles if possible or abandon them and go back. That's why you find no armored columns from either side. No armored columns, big columns in attack from the Ukrainian side. No big armored columns in defense from the Russian side. That's why the next point, you see no tank to tank battles. In all these videos that have come out, all these pictures, all the descriptions, there are no battles between tanks armored forces from one side and armored forces from the other. This is the new battlefield where don't you use masked anything. You may use masked intelligence, masked electronics, stuff like that, but not masked armor, not masked artillery, not, mar not masked infantry because you don't want to expose anything to today's modern fi firepower that can inflict a lot of casualties very quickly. So again, no tank to tank battles. If we saw earlier as tanks came in from the Russian side, there were no Ukrainian tanks fighting them in most places. And similarly, now Ukrainian tanks, although they are going out in penny pockets, again, they are not being confronted by Russian tanks. What is confronting them? They are being con uh, confronted by, they are being confronted by loitering munitions, which are literally loitering but which are not loitering sort of aimlessly they are loitering they are waiting for signals so if a target is identified maybe by a russian drone or by through other means that target information is fed into the loitering munition which goes which then goes and strikes the target that's also true of the missiles that the russians are using the anti-tank guided missiles once again those targets are being picked up and those missiles are being fired by mostly by Russian helicopters floating very far away from the from, from the battle lines. In some cases, five to nine to ten kilometers away, so as to stay out of Ukrainian surface-to-air missile zones. I will tell you about that in a little bit more detail as we go along. So, no armored columns from, from either side, no tank-to-tank -tank battles. Number three. Ukrainian side in attack, they are being very cautious and these attacks are looking like probing attacks, like right? thrust and parry. It's like boxers before, before the decisive part of the bout, before they come to the decisive part of the bout, they spar, they thrust, parry, they spar, they check out the other side, they check out the other side's responses. So the attack so far from the Ukrainian side look like that. Both sides at this point are prioritizing minimizing their losses and that's why both sides are following the tactics of holding a territory only if they are quite sure of holding it or then withdrawing. The village of Makarivka, for example, if you see the military media or the open source media, on the Ukrainian side, there was a lot of excitement that took the village called Makarivka. So they took that village, there were videos of Ukrainian Marines at the village with the Ukrainian flag, but then they vacated that village because they did not want to hold that territory and fight these pitched battles again over a fixed piece of real estate. In fact, the Ukrainian defense ministry has said that they've deoccupied the village. So that is how this war is different. The essential difference this time is 
something that I can tell you. I, I can tell you with the line of a familiar Hindi film song. And that line is, Shikari khud yahan shikar ho gaya. Because it were the Russians who had come attacking, right? Russians had come attacking. Now Russians are defending. Because when they came attacking, they took a bunch of territory. They could not take Kiev. They thought they'll take Kiev in three days and war will be over and they'll be able to just describe it as special military op operation. They said, this is 500 days on. This war is on and right now, Russians are having to defend. They are sitting in trenches with three lines of defenses and they are now defending. They are having to defend what they had acquired more than one year ago. And they are being now hunted in turn by the Euro Ukrainians. So the hunter has become the hunted, but also importantly, the hunted has become the hunter. And what that changes with the equation is the fact that the hunter now is exposed. Earlier, as the Russians were coming in, they were driving in, they were the ones exposed. So they were taking losses, big losses, enormous losses. Now, the Ukrainians, Ukrainians are attacking, so they are taking losses. So you see these pictures of the Ukrainian leopard tanks, the recently gifted German tanks destroyed, and you can see the Russian side rejoicing in them and saying, oh, the Germans should be used to seeing their tanks destroyed in the in the Russian planes, in the Ukrainian planes, because that's what happened in the Second World War, right, to Hitler's forces. So they are having fun on their side. But the fact is that Ukrainian forces are now exposed and the Russian forces can sit in the trenches or stay behind or stay behind the line of contact of land forces and fight this war from there. So once again, the hunter has become the hunted. In either case, so shikari khud yahan, shikar ho gaya. So let's see what this leads to. There are losses, next point, there are losses being suffered on both sides. So Ukrainians are attacking now, they are suffering more losses than before and you can see that, you can see that in the wreckages of Ukrainian armor, which the Russians have been sharing with the world and it's a reality, a lot of this has been damaged. Ukrainian side would claim, however, that a lot of the Bradleys, which, are, which have been hit by the Russian side, by the Russian weapons, they've actually been destroyed, some have been, some have been pulled back for repairs and might even be repaired. But the fact is that they claim that the Bradleys have performed their basic function, which is shielding or protecting the infantry riding in, riding in them. So you see videos of many of these infantrymen coming out of these Bradleys and then carrying on with their battle. Nature of warfare has changed. Nature of warfare, as we told you earlier on, is not like columns from two sides fighting. This is not like one commander give, gives a call and then you go marauding, trying to take big towns, big objectives, nothing. This is now small probing operations, basically going and attacking the, for the attacker, the other side's trench lines and to see if, if, can, if you can dislodge defenders from one set of trench lines and then stop. That's why the advance, while the Ukrainians have made some advance in 15 days, but basically even in 15 days, at the deepest level, their advance is no more than two kilometers. In fact, the Ukrainian Deputy Defense Minister, Hannah Maliar, has issued a statement and, and I'm sharing with you. There she says, our troops are moving in conditions of extremely fierce battles, the enemy aviation and artillery superiority. In the Burdians direction, fighting continues in the direction of Makarivka. Now, after that, the Ukrainians took Makarivka and then, and then they gave up. There is no claim that the Russians have come and taken it over. But the fact is that Ukrainians have preferred not to sit and fight for that village, not, not, not to dig their own trenches there because their objective is to stay mobile and keep pushing because direction they are after is the direction in the south. Again, if you look at the map, this is this is going south. This is not this is not pushing. This is not pushing east towards say Russia. This is going south 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 east. That is towards the Black Sea. What is it that the Ukrainians are after? They regained the city of Kherson on their side of the Dnieper River some months back. Then we had a full episode of Karta Klatter about that. On this side. On the eastern side now, they are fighting to go south. Why? Because they want to get as close to Crimea as possible. Because if they get close enough to Crimea, then the Kirsch Bridge, which is the only, only connection between the Russian mainland and Crimea that supplies Crimea militarily for, 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 for its civilian population, etc. If their long-range artillery and missiles, medium-range missiles, can target that bridge. So if the Ukrainians can get so close, moving towards the south, that is 
come close to the, the town of Melitopol. Please see it on your map. If they get close to the town of Melitopol or maybe take Melitopol, that will be their best case scenario. Then they can target the Kerch Bridge. If they can target the Kerch Bridge and make this unsustained and make this insecure or maybe take down the bridge with artillery fire and short range missile fire, or short medium range missile fire, then it might, they will hope that the Russian hold over Crimea will become unsustainable. Crimea, as we know, is what Russia had occupied in 2014. So that looks like the objective of the attackers. But right now, the movement is very, very slow. In fact, once again, in fact, once again, if I look at the claims of the Ukrainian side, these are once again, let me underline to you, claims only of the Ukrainian side. And yet these are not dramatic claims. They are not saying that Russians are running away. They are not saying Russians are running away or we are running over Russian defenses. They are saying that in the Bakhmut direction, Bakhmut, by the way, is a small town, maybe an overgrown village of which both countries have fought for several months and after many months of really bitter fighting, the Russians claim that, that they took the town. More than the Russian armed forces, the Wagner group, which is a mercenary group, they claim they took the town. But now also fighting is going on and Ukrainians have taken over some of the outskirts of the town. But in that direction, Ukrainians claim, Ukrainians claim that, they, they, that they advanced over the last 48 hours, that they advanced from 200 to 500 meters on a wide front. 200 to 500 meters in two days, 48 hours. That's nothing, right? That tells you how strong the resistance is or how cagey, how careful the Ukrainians are in that advance. And in the Zaporizhia area, Zaporizhia section, Zaporizhia is the place where Europe's biggest nuclear power plant is. Russians control it. In that area, they say they progressed in two days, 48 hours, about 300 to 350 meters. Now, over how much of a front it is? Is it over a wide front? Is it over a narrow front? So I'm sharing with you a podcast, a very good podcast on War on the Rocks. It's a, it's a, it's a platform that I track regularly to figure out what's happening in, in the war in Ukraine. And this is a podcast by two experts, Nick Danforth and Michael Kaufman. And they tell us this advances over a wide front, but a 15 kilometer wide front, not a 100, 200 kilometer wide front, a 15 kilometer wide front. And this advance is quite shallow. If anything, the Ukrainians are still engaging with the first of the three lines of defense that the Russians have laid along this front. So this is a lot of work to do right now. This podcast is headlined Ukraine's multiple axis of attack. If you are interested in the war, I would suggest you take a close look at it. Then the other important point in the war, you see very little activity in the air. Where are the jets? Where are the MiGs? Where are the Sukhois? Forget Ukrainian, uh, forget Ukrainian Air Force. They are hardly left with any air power, barring some helicopters. But what about the Russians? What about the mighty Russian Air Force? So in fact, I might also raise a follow-up question, which is that how long has it been since you've seen Russian Air Force in action? So it's quite clear now that today's in today's battlefield environment, where surface-to-air missile defenses are so good and so effective, it's very tough for an air force unless it has top-class electronic protection or top-class suppression of air defenses, which is mostly done electronically, it will not venture over hostile airspace. So it's one thing for the Ukrainians not to have air power over the battlefield. It's quite another, another, it's quite another for Russians to almost not have it, at least not visibly. That in fact exposes the that in fact exposes the limitations of air power. So in doctrinal terms, that's a very important lesson. That if you don't have air superiority, total air superiority, now you might say air to air, in the air, Russians have total air superiority because Ukrainians no longer have a credible air force that can challenge Russian air force should they show up over the battlefield. But why are they not showing up over the battlefield? But why are they not showing up over the battlefield? Because they are afraid of the surface to air missile defenses that the Ukrainians have. Even though the Patriots, the best missiles that they have, are still consumed in protecting their cities and key targets. They can't come anywhere near the front. But yet the number and the accuracy of surface to air missile systems they have that they have including man pads that is the man portable missile systems so that is enough of a deterrent to keep the mighty russian air force away and that in a way also exposes the limitation 
of the modern air forces unless you have total air superiority and unless you have much better electronics. So to be effective, today's air forces have to be, first of all, electronically protected with Russian air forces, particularly fixed wing aircraft are not as is evident in these battles now because Russians on the, are on the defensive given the fact that of the two sides, they are the only ones with an air force which still flies at a massive air force. You would have thought that they will use this air power, this air superiority to completely pulverize the Ukrainians, but they are not doing it. At the same time, it's not as if, it's not as if they are not doing anything. So I shared with you another article, long article. I'm sharing a link with you. If you have patience, do read it. It's very interestingly written with a lot of visuals and a lot of videos. This is from a publication called thedrive.com. Now, that's also a publication I track closely to learn about the war. But also, they have a lot of intelligent stuff always about air power, combat air power. Now, there is an article there by Thomas Newdick and Tyler Rogoway. That is headlined, Ukraine's armor helicopter problem. And that says that Ukraine's advancing armor, it may be advancing in penny pockets, but it's now being confronted and with very good effect by Russian helico helicopters, combat helicopters, particularly Kamov 52, which has a NATO code name. I don't know why NATO give these code names and, and on what lo logic. It's, it has the NATO code name of Hokum. Now that helicopter, see the picture, looks quite menacing, but it does, but it does not appear over the battlefield. This helicopter is now using a bunch of missiles, a bunch of missiles which can be fired from far away. These are anti-tank guided missiles. One of these is 9M120I Ataka-1, which has a 5 kilometer range. So the helicopter can be 5 kilometers away and fire from there and can be terrain hugging so low. So it's very difficult for air defenses or surface to air missiles from the, from the Ukrainian lines to be able to counter this helicopter. So helicopter is, so the helicopter is relatively safe. They have another missile which is 9, 9A4172K Vikr, V-I-K-H-R, which is 5 to 6 miles, about 8 to 9 kilometers. So that helicopter, with that missile, the helicopter can be that far away. Now the important thing is both these missiles ride on laser beams. So the, they reach the target on laser beams. Now some, some drone or some electronic sniffing equipment identifies the target, tells the helicopter pilot where the target is, the heli helicopter pilot launches the missile. The important thing is because it's laser guided, the helicopter has to be in the air and reasonably stable and in the same area to be able to guide that missile because helicopter it is which is letting out the laser beam on which the missile is riding. So for that period, the helicopter is vulnerable to surface to air missiles from the Ukrainian side. But because they are so far away, they are also keeping low. And because Ukraine does not have as many of these short for short range air defense weapons, because today's battlefield, it seems requires a lot more of these than, than may have been thought earlier. And the Russians so far have been quite effective by using loitering munitions in carrying out what is called as said in dead operations. All armed forces love acronym. This is suppression of enemy air defense or destruction of enemy air defense. That is said and dead. S-E-A-D, D-E-A-D. Russians have done it very well and they've done it using glide bombs. So the method they are using is they use a lot of glide bombs to target Ukrainian moving forces because forces are exposed. And now if the Ukrainians switch on their own surface to air missile systems or surface to air gun systems, to shoot down these glide bombs. They are able to shoot down a lot of these glide bombs. But the moment they switch on their systems, then Russian drones can pick up the signal from these Ukrainian air defense systems, particularly the, particularly the missile systems. These are then immediately fed into the loitering munitions that the Russians have there, which come and hit these Ukrainian air defense. And so that is how these battles are now being fought. These are high-tech battles between two very proficient armies. So I will conclude this by reading out a tweet from Shashank Joshi, who is the defense editor at The Economist. Again, somebody I read very seriously and I follow constantly. And he says in this tweet, if modern sensors and precision weapons mean armies have to fight in smaller and dispersed units, smaller dispersed units, not, not massed units, smaller and dispersed units, and each unit needs a short-range a short, a short air defense system. 
does it vastly increase the number of short range systems needed or is coverage sufficiently broad to protect even dispersed units now i can tell you what would change the situation this would have changed the situation if the ukrainians had fixed wing aircraft that could go and challenge say these russian helico helicopters in their airspace and that's why the ukrainians have been demanding the f-16 so i see a lot of this coverage coming out of the western press maybe some of it is also a lot of the coverage is saying that the russians are doing much better than was imagined in defense and also russian helicopters are doing well and ukrainians have no way of dealing with them so maybe this is also kind of lobbying it's also increasing pressure for the americans to release those f-16s to to the ukrainians on which ukrainian pilots have been training so once again Finally, I will share with you an article from the Washington Post by Dan Lemoth, who again we who again we follow often, and others, and that says that Pentagon's assessment is that that this war will be long and very violent. Will go on for a long time. This is an article by Dan Lemoth, David Stern, and Emily Rauhala. So I am sharing a link of that article also with you.